Hello people, welcome, another video. This one's going to be a little bit all over the place, but we're going to cover some important topics. Topics including the much sought after grand juries. Now in England, um, there was some legislation over the years that have basically done away with the administration of grand juries. And I kind of thought, well, let's go down that rabbit hole. How can you get rid of something that's almost like a cornerstone of the law system in a country, you know, grand juries and petty juries, or just juries in general? One being of 20-odd people, 25, 24, 23. The whole point of a grand jury is that for minor offences, there's they're supposed to be like the 13th vote is the casting vote, you know, so it's a deciding vote. You get over like the... Um, the halfway point, the tipping point, the scales, if you like, of justice. So where 12 and 12 could be balanced, the idea of like 25 is that you have the 13th, you know, the 51%, essentially you get that, that scale starts to tip in the favour. So imagine walking into a grand jury hall saying, he stole my bike, uh, these two guys saw him do it, and I wish this man indicted to answer for his crimes and answer, and um, you know, to, you know, answer for himself basically in his actions. So then you'd have a room full of um, people. Uh, if you watch my criminal justice video where I explore that vi uh, that film, they have a grand jury there where a lady comes out and she um, she basically gives the evidence by her prosecutor to the grand jury. And you have a room six, twelve, eighteen, twenty-four, normally uh, eight, sixteen, twenty-four. You know, like rows of people. And you go in, and then and then the foreman of the grand jury would say, uh, who you know, like who finds this bill true. And um, they would put their hand up, or something to that effect, you know. And then, you know, some people put their hand down, some people might have some questions, and other people put their hand up when it comes to casting a vote. And as long as you get a tipping point, then that would go back into the courtroom, because this is outside of the courtroom in a private chamber where any of the grand jury sits in a private room. So once they've deliberated what they've, they've decided, if it's a true bill, um, then it goes back into, um, into the main courtroom in front of the judge, the judge, the judiciary essentially would, would see the true bill and then he would issue out the warrant for the arrest of such and such a person. That's essentially how it works. Uh, and obviously if it's a not true bill, like the, the, you know, the jury, it is really the grand jury's job to kind of determine the merits and the strips of the case. Now, there's been a lot of controversy about grand juries, about the fact that like in America in particular, I read a very good article about how like 99% of all, of you know, it's, it's a ridiculously high figure of all, of all indictments end up being granted and it seems like well what's the point in having a grand jury if they just say yes all the time and it's like yeah that's a good point I mean if they're just saying yes to anything anyway why why do they have grand juries to, to, to just say you know just like it's almost like a rubber stamping exercise we're just going to say yes anyway because and in, in, in the flip side to that of course they're going to say yes because if someone comes before you and has a re you know has the witnesses has the case has the crime has the facts then the, no one in the, in our land, in the common law land, it, you know, the, the word is your bond. You know, you, you no one is ex lying and telling mistruths in our culture is, is is actually, especially in the judicial sense, is 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 a disaster. It's just you don't do it. You never doubt someone's word because it's like uh, you know you're doubting their honour, their integrity, their character. So everyone's word is accepted. So when a jury hears your your uh, account of the crime, of course they're going to accept it, and therefore. You know they're going to grant it, so that kind of makes sense why that goes hand in hand. Now I'm looking at it um, from a point of view that the there used to be these things in England up and down the country where you had uh, court of, uh, court of quarter sessions, so quarter sessions every quarter in the year um, in in your local town hall, for example, uh, the grand jury would meet and they would hear all the all the cases of the of the um, of the county or the area that they're in. And um, you had these little judiciary offers, I think they're called circuit judges, would go around and sit at these court sessions just to make sure that obviously the judiciary is present as an impartial umpire, if you like, referee, to make sure things are done in, in an in a, in a orderly manner in accordance to the law. And that's essentially that. Now, they also had the court of the Assizes. Now, I found out it's actually called Assizes. Assizes. Now, Assizes is almost like the French word for like, essay of vous, like, um, sit, will you, like, please take a seat. Um, so assizes is basically a seated judge where they would always be seated. And that would be, uh, I think, in Westminster somewhere where the, there would also be a seated permanent position for a grand jury of some nature or judiciary office. Um, and that's basically how it was administrated. Now, they, they got rid of these 
uh, by statute, they failed. Well, I wouldn't say they failed to administrate it, but they decided that it's too cumbersome, too costly, too administrative to to um, to have grand juries administered anymore. You now, for someone like me who's into the into the common law, you'd be like, "Whoa, <laughs> that seems a bit that's a bit audacious, isn't it?" To remove the the public conscience and morality aspect from certain elements of law. And um, I read a lot into that and what they actually did to, did to that. Now, there's all kinds of statutes and stuff around this, um, particularly in England, for example, around, was it 1885, I believe, or 89, when they, when they consolidated all the different jurisdictions and, and types of courts into the High Court um, and abolish, abolish things like King's Bench and Queen's Bench, so to speak. And then you've got things like they, um, they then went on to have, they still had the Court of Sessions and the Assizes, but they um, they eventually phased them out over time, particularly towards the 1885 to like the 1940s. Very few, and then eventually they abolished the the quarter sessions and the assizes completely. In the, I think it's the Courts Act 1971 or two, something like that. So I'm, I've been following this rabbit hole, going, oh, what the hell's been going on with all this nonsense? And um, I thought, well, let's let's just like do a process of elimination. It's all part of like in my investigations into what's going on. Because let's say, right, we don't have the act, we don't have the the service or the facility or the, or, or the in some in some cases you might even say the right to to go in front of a grand jury and plead a case. And as, this is particularly in in common law terms of crimes. Okay, now crimes themselves are pretty much in the legal arena as far as I'm as far as I can tell. Now I'm kind of sitting on the fence as to whether that's in strictly true because you have as as I'll go through here, you have two types of laws going on. And I'm looking at this law in an old law book. So you have law, common law, as described here, and this is a very much a, a book for the legal society, you know, the terms of art of law and what they believe the um, the law is. So you have what, what is essentially described as the lex non scripta in Latin, so law non written, and then you have up here you have things um, uh, lex scripta, the written, that is the statute law. So both of these things can fall within the common law, interestingly enough, what common law written and common law unwritten. And the whole point here of the common law is that it's based on common law like proper, I think it's even just defined as proper up here, um, yeah, common law properly so called, the law, the lex non scripta or unwritten law, so unwritten, nothing written down, it's, um, it doesn't need to be written down, you know, you know inherent wrongs are wrong, some people don't, but you know, <laughs> good people do, and as it's been said, the law courts are not for good people. Yeah, the law courts are for the bad people. <laughs> bad people need courts of law. Good people don't need courts of law. Um, unwritten laws include not only general customs or the common law, properly so called. Interesting. So general customs or the common law, properly so called. But also the particular customs of certain parts of the kingdom. And likewise, those particular laws that are by customs observed only in certain courts and jurisdiction. So that's quite interesting. So it's properly called, properly so called common law or general customs. This is where like the common law has like two elements to it. You have common law which is essentially like the Ten Commandments and, and the um the New Testament bit of like forgiveness. And then you have this the scripted law, the or the uh, yeah, the Lex Script scripta, which is the statute law. Now in here it's talking about the statute law is very much like a fashion. You know, it changes from day to day or from I wouldn't say day to day I would say well it can change day to day but it's more it changes from ages to ages if you like or from from um, from generation to generation depending on what fashions appear uh, you know they come and go I, I'm saying fashions I'm just trying to put it in like lay terms that people like us can kind of relate to so if we read here so the Lex uh, excuse me, where are I? Yeah, the rule of a bond. So this is sorry, uh, like the Saxon. The laws of England are divided into three parts now. The one is the common law, which is the most ancient and general law of the realm and common to the whole kingdom, being appropriate thereto and have 
no dependence upon foreign law whatsoever, which I thought was quite interesting. It's two, statutes or acts of parliament made by the passing of the king, lords and commons in parliament being a reserve for the government. So the government has this reserve right to pass certain laws under certain um, confirmations, whether commons, lords, and then a sent, sent to royal assent to the king. Arising through corruption of the times. So corruption of the times. Now, let's bring it back to my fashion analogy. I was like, yeah, so, or even like in Donald Trump. Let's say Donald Trump becomes like prime minister of England. His mum apparently is of Scottish origin. So he could theoretically ask for a British passport, run for election, somehow get elected. And then he becomes the populist, because that's essentially what democracy is. It's a populist um, opinion or, or, or momentum movement of the time that allows certain certain um, left and right, if you like, it's always referred to into those terms, left and right policies to be um, put forward as a as a as a, a will of the people, so to speak, uh, or at least the will of the uh, electorate. So let's say Donald Trump comes into law and he says, right, every one of you people now has to wear dungarees with pink t-shirts all right now that that's like yeah people i know it's this ridiculous kind of concept but you know this was fashion at one point in the 80s obviously you can clearly tell the 80s was a interesting fashion time experimental so you've got a guy there in the background in a traditional suit looking at her going what the hell is she wearing you've got a guy there with his uh, slightly outrageous jacket going yeah come on dude let's get out of it and then you've got the lady here wearing her fashion i don't care i don't care i'm gonna do it i can do what i want this is this is right to me but obviously dungarees came and went like a fashion they come and they go and in another you never know when dungarees are going to come back in I've, I've looked on the internet it looks like there's some particularly good pictures of dungarees nowadays so you know in some parts like let's say japan for example there's a few people wearing dungarees in japan and other parts of the world but this is what i'm saying fashions come and go cultures come and go um donald trump will come and go you know what i mean things come and go but the law the law law the proper law which our society is based on which is essentially the judeo-christian culture the old testament the very simple ten commandments you know and the element of what Jesus taught about the, um, the concept of forgiveness, forgiveness of sins, forgiveness of debts, highlighted again in the um, King James Version of the Bible, where the Lord's Prayer is actually mentioned in debts, forgive us our debts as we forgive those who debt or against us. And that's the actual wording in the, in the Lord's Prayer in that, in that book. So it's about money. Look, if people owe you money, forgive them of, the, of, their, of, their, of, of their, their debt as you would wish to be forgiven of yours because, you know, if you can't pay or it's going to cause you serious hardship in order to repay the debt. So that's the element of forgiveness there. So let's go back to this little book. So that's the corruption of the times, if you like. So, um, I, you know, you could say this is a corruption of fashion. Someone's come out with this idea. It's being marketed everywhere. Everyone believes, hey, I'm going to be cool if I wear dungarees. But let, lo and behold, the, the general population are actually looking at you like you're a bit of an idiot. There we go. That's a good way of putting it. You see, so this is the status quo in the background, and this is the corruption of the time. Ha ha! That's a nice way to switch it around. I hope that's a good metaphor. So, um, a com uh, and by this, this is good. And by this, um, the common law is amended where defective. So, where injury, harm, and loss, and all the contract stuff that all the free man on the land got about, where it becomes defective for the suppression of. Um, public evils, though the common law and statute law can concur, so they can be in agreement, or they might interfere with each other. Yeah, That's very important. So the written law might interfere with the unwritten law. But where there is interference, the common law shall be preferred, because it's more grounded, more tested, more... more... Um, yeah, grounded, tested, and more uh, wise. Maybe wise would be would be a, a good way of putting it. Um, so yeah, so the common, so where the statutes interfering with the law of the law of the land, as it's actually highlighted down here, the law of the land, the law of the customs of the people, which would be a Judeo-Christian, and also local customs, which are probably pretty much defunct now. But um, you know, whatever local customs you have, in terms of like, you know, little quirky cultural things. Particular customs, but blah, 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 okay. And that's basically, I hope I've made my point there in relation to this is a very well written book. 
um, you know, in, in what a paragraph or two, they pretty much defined very concisely what they. This is how their society, the, the, you know, a society that relates to these kind of terms of art. This is how they put it down in very simple, very clear definitions of how the law interacts. So that's now going back to our. Um, Court, court, court of quarter, se quarter sessions and the assizes and the abolishment of the grand jury. So now that that's like the statute has essentially abolished it by by statute. They've abolished these services. So where as before we could run into a courtroom and say, hey, I've got, a, I've got, I wish to lay an in information. I wish to do an indictment or whatever like that. Um, it's like where do we go now? And that's where I've been exploring this in more about um, private prosecutions. And access to justice. See, the thing is, the common law, the common law element is something that I've been looking at, versus like legislative elements. So I've I've um, looked at the Theft Act. If you look at the Theft Act 1967 or eight or something like that, um, it actually tells you that a certain a certain thing is get abolished every now and again. So the crime of extortion is abolished from the statute law, the written law. So the written law will not acknowledge. Extortion, it's not part of their written statute law book. But it doesn't mean that statute, it doesn't mean that um, extortion has suddenly become lawful. What it means is that from an administrative point of view in the legislation is, it's off the statute book, it's going back to unwritten. Everyone knows you can't extort people, it's wrong. So therefore, we don't need to write that down. Everyone knows extortion is wrong. It's quite as old as the hills. It's a, it's a form of theft, a form of um, uh, assault, I suppose you could say. And um, therefore, you know, it's off the statute book. It goes back to where it belongs. And there we go. Uh, and uh, what I mean by that is like, let's take the, the ancient, you know, the, the oldest crime in the book is probably just murder. Right? I'm going to kill you. You know, so that's like, you know, let's say now the statute book says, right, now let's, let's, let's legislate for murder. Let's write down murder in more details. Let's define murder. Let's define, like, when it can be used and when it can't be used. And how does that differ from what people inherently know is right? Now, the thing is with murder, it's pretty extreme. You know, there have to be pretty extreme circumstances where you can just justify the use of such lethal force so that you can you can go in front of let's say a grand jury again to justify your actions okay so it's real i mean even if it is made lawful in certain circumstances and you and you plead those circumstances to the jury the jury might say yeah well actually though you're you're just a you're just a dangerous man you need to go into prison because you just seem like you 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 were saving the opportunity to use that right use that force in order to kill someone so it's always up to for interpretation how you present that to the to the jury so now back to where have juries gone? Well, where have juries gone? Especially grand juries. Now, we still have juries in Crown Court. Praise the Lord. <laughs> but grand juries have gone. Now, I can, now, let's look at it from an administrative point of view. You've got to, you've got to get 25 people-ish from the local community to meet on some sort of regular basis to administrate indictments and, and, and pleas to the grand jury of wrongdoings. So you can see across a whole country, a nation, a province, whatever you want to call it, that can actually be quite a pain in the ass to administer. And I probably agree with that relation. So abolishing them is fine. I have no real problem with, with the government saying these are too cumbersome to uh, administrate. What are we going to do? We're going to abolish them. Fine. And what are you going to do once you've abolished them? Where are people going to go for justice? And this is where I've been looking at it. So, all right, they've got rid of the court of the quarter sessions. They've got rid of the court of the assizes. Where have these courts gone to? Or where have these grand juries? Or where have the, where has the pleading of the, uh, the the wrongdoing gone to? For the layman, most importantly, for those that are stupid and not um, um, trained or well practiced in the terms of art or the the legislative law. So therefore, you have to look into the legislative law <laughs> to find out what the legislation has done in order to administrate justice. Now, you've got to bear in mind they've released all kinds of things like police services, ooh, policy services, so that if there's a crime being committed, you call 999 and they will handle it for you. You don't get involved. But remember, those powers that police have aren't, aren't unique to the police. Everyone has the power of arrest, and that's, that's highlighted in most 
um, law books is that you know the power of arrest isn't isn't a, a police thing. Arrest has been you know around for a long time, particularly if you're seeing people doing wrongdoing. Essentially, your power of arrest um, is is allowed. But I would, I would just say, unless you know what you're doing, guys, don't don't go around arresting people. <laughs> Because, because uh, you know, in many cases, you actually you, you'll find yourself breaking the law by arresting people. Um, so yeah, just just be careful about that. I'm not I'm not saying you should go out and arrest willy nilly, but you know, the powers of arrest aren't exclusive. Is my point to just the police service. Now, um, so here we have a bit of legislation here. So the Courts Act 1971. Oh, this is where they abolished it. So basically, in, in abolishing the grand juries. Indictments, so exclusive, ju exclusive jurisdiction in trial on indictment. All proceedings on indictment shall be brought before the Crown Court. So it's interesting now. So they want you to bring indictments here before the Crown Court. And who's in the Crown Court? No one. There's just one judiciary member there. Now what they've decided is that instead of having 25 local people, they're going to put a, a sworn-in judicial uh, member if you like, a judge, someone who holds an office where they have to be impartial and obviously look at look at things from a judicial sense. Say, so look, you're going to sit there as the grand jury and you're going to decide them, you know, whether or not that should or shouldn't be given. And to be fair, 99% of the time, or 98, 99%, whatever you want to look at it, of grand juries do grant it. A judicial member is not there to doubt your word. He's literally there to take your indictment on face value just maybe have one or two questions from a, from maybe like an administrative side, but I'd be very surprised if they even do that. They check the paperwork over and then they would say, okay, so this is a crime. Now, is it a written crime or is it an unwritten crime? You know, is it a wrong of a written t nature or is it a wrong of an unwritten nature? And you, you should know the difference between the two of those. And therefore, your indictment potentially should go forward. So it's like, okay, so the Crown Court is where we go for indictments. What the hell is an indictment? Now, this is really interesting because I don't know if I've still got the Indictment Act up. I do. The Indictment Act 1915 is still being referred to in a lot of um, criminal statute books as how, how you and I would interact with the legal government in order to create a suit of indictment for an unwritten or even a written law, it seems. So, um, and in here it has all the wording and stuff like that. I don't know if I can get down to that thing. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's nice. Have a read. But it's very simple. And I actually confirm this. I don't even know if it's here. Oh, here we go. So this is how the legal society... I remember what Carl Lentz has said about, you know, one or two word claims, right? This is why I like these things. I'm like, you know, look how that, that's your whole suit. Even for the legal society, this is their indictment form, yeah? Indictment. It's, uh, and this, don't copy this, whatever you do. <laughs> this is how they produce their indictments for their society, Okay. Um, in accordance to their rules, okay. So, um, but look how simple this is. You look at uh, like to get the ball rolling as an indictment, a criminal pr procedure rule. So again, that's just for their society. But a form of indictment. This is a form of indictment, not necessarily an indictment, okay. And then it says indictment <laughs> in the Crown Court. So they're pre pre um, predefining where it's going to go. So they're saying in. Uh, the Crown Court at da 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 da, which we've all we've all learnt what the meanings of those words are, the ins and the ats, and the Queen versus. So this is where you bring the suit on behalf of the Queen. Now the Queen and the land is one, or the the uh, the, the people and the land is one. The Queen and the people, the Queen and the land is one as well. So this is where the people are using their sovereign right of the Queen as part as as if you like as a as a constitutional part of the um, of the Queen being a subject. This is where they can bring a suit, the Queen versus John Doe, Doe or Richard Rowe, whichever way you want to look at that. And then you have your charges, your statement, you know, you have your statement of the offence, and you have the particulars. And that's it. Pretty much, it's very, very simple. Talk about your two, three word sentences. It's very similar to um, what the, um, the N1 form. This is why I like the M1 form when you're making a claim, um, because. I don't know if this is, yeah, here we are. So like the N1 form, this is just like a simple money claim at your county court level. So it's just like a civil debt. Um, this is this is very simple too. It's like, who are they? No, who are you? Who are they? What happened? What's the value of money involved? And then particulars of your claim. And then you sign it. 
I mean, that's, this is really simple. And obviously, this is this is done in a legal format because they want you to come down their legal route to do it. But essentially, you can see how idiot-proof this form is. Who are you? Who are they? What happened? What's the money involved? Okay, everyone knows that. And then just write down what happened. Sign it. Say it's true. Boom. You got your. You got your. <laughs> you got, unfortunately, you have to pay a fee here for some reason hmm. uh, because you're going through an agent. But you know, essentially, your court fee has to be paid in order to get it for them to to perform the uh, filing on your behalf. Well, that's, I just I just love the simplicity of it. You know, when I saw this form, I was like, "Holy hey, crap! This is so simple. It might be might be something worth considering." So yeah, that's their indictment. So we're going back to indictments now. I thought, okay, indictments, interesting concept. Looks like it's an it's a form of legal inter. It's like a ticket, if you like. It's a ticket to ride on the legal on the legal criminal or well, I wouldn't say criminal. I want to avoid that word criminal, but you know, more like a wrongdoing, uh, an evil, a wrong, uh, immoral. A, grie a grievance, you know, those kind of words, rather than going down the criminal route. Because I I, I, I'm not sure, but I think criminal might be a legal... I'm not entirely sure, but I think that's like relating to their legal kind of processes and procedures. So crimes as such relate to their defined crimes or their interpretation of what a wrong is, you know. Whereas I'm just saying someone's done me wrong and, you know, someone's, someone's you know, um, you know, done a murder, robbery or something like that. You know, so, yeah. You know, it, it, it may very well be criminal, but I'm just saying it's a wrongdoing. It's a trespass, if you like. It's something that is, uh, in, you, know, unri you know, since the dawn of time is wrong. Don't know when criminal was invention invented. If, if you wish to define it as criminal, that's fine. But I, I'm just calling it a wrongdoing, a trespass. Uh, oh, I've done him already. Sorry, I'm getting off topic. I'm going to get rid of Dungaree's girl at last. Um, yeah, so that's it. So, yeah, so all proceedings start in the Crown Court. So I was like, well, all right, okay. Let's go back. So we know indictments are pretty simple. We know um, civil claims are pretty simple. Dare I say, idiot proof. And now we're going to go through to what I actually had a day out, enjoying myself, doing some of these things. Now I've got a load of images I was taking on my phone. So I went into the, um, the archives of my local county and we had a little look. Now I'll, I'll have to pause this and rewind. So we're going to go through some indictments now. So these are old indictments as they used to be at the quarter sessions. So remember you had the quarter sessions and you had the assizes. Oh, sorry, the assizes. <laughs> so the quarter sessions would be in the local, very much a local area, like a county hall for that county. And um, very much back then you were divided into counties and counties were divided into parishes where the churches would administrate the laity, the flock, if you would. And um, these are worded in a, in a very interesting way. But it's very simple, and it's just something I wanted to look look at, like how they were worded in the old days versus how they're worded now in the um, almost like the um, uh, what do they call it? Secular is it secular government kind of manner? Whereas here it's a bit more pomp and majesty, if you like. So I tried to video this, so I go backwards and forwards a few times just to read it out to you. Now, and obviously it's old handwriting, so it's a little bit tricky, but I try and do my best to you as I do. So the first thing here is sorry, so that's the county. The jurors for our Lord, the King. So the jurors for our Lord, the King, upon their oaths, so they have to be sworn in, present that Charles Smith... late I think of the parish of somewhere I'm going to pause uh, that Mary it's probably Elizabeth oh is that right Mary hang on. yeah Elizabeth Elizabeth in the county of Surrey Labour uh, labourer, oh labourer, his title, on the 8th day of August in the 1st, um, I think that's normally the 1st year, oh god, year of the reign of our sovereign, oh yeah, 18, so maybe it's the 1st year of um, Victoria, is it? Ah, oh, maybe that's what it was, Victoria, Lord George the... Fourth, by the grace of God, of the United Kingdom, 
of Great Britain and Ireland, King and Defender of the Faith. Mm. Don't get that on indictments now, do you? With is that with with force and I think that's force, a force and arms, and arm, arms. Don't know what that is. Arms, yeah, force and arms. The parish a for said. In the county a for said. Two coats. So these are local um, quarter sessions. They tended to be more assaults and thefts and things like that, you know, real wrongs, um, unwritten wrongs. Let's put them in that word. Uh, and so they were um, small, you know, smaller things, less, less grandiose crimes, if you like, or wrongs or trespasses, however you want to look at it. Yeah. And more things like murders and stuff like that would actually go straight up to the assizes. Uh, they wouldn't necessarily deal with them locally in the court sessions. You know, on those indictments, you'd be dragged up to the uh, the big boys. Um, two coats of the value of come on, go right of five pounds. That's quite a lot of money back then. So two coats of five pounds of the goods. Now they're saying goods. See, now they're conflating it. To the property, they're saying goods. This is where I start getting a bit dubious about the wording. Ah, oh, and chattels. There we are, back to goods and chattels. So there we are, it's generic chattels being property of George Haynes. Hands? George, I don't know, Hands. Then and there, I think that's felony. Uh, uh, but, oh. I don't know. They normally say felon at criminal, like, they normally express the manner in which is every. Uh, oh, a, maybe A for said again. Then and there, felonously did steal, steal, take, and carry away. So now you're talking about larceny, yeah? So uh, taking and carrying away. Steal, taking, carry away. So they're using simple words here. Not, they're not using larceny. They're using simple language. Against the peace of our said Lord, the King. Oh, this is still King George. Sorry. Uh, woo, zoom in. His crown and dignity. Boom. Now, these things always signed Lawson. Every single, look, you can see it here, Lawson, 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 Lawson. I don't know why. I've looked into the word Lawson. I can't find out why, but they just all signed Lawson for some reason. Okay, so that was that. Now, I wonder if I turn it over here. It'd be nice if we turn it over and have a look on the back. We might have got a bit of time left. Whoop. So turn it over. And now this is essentially on the back of your indictment. You write the names of the witnesses. So um, one, two, and three. So he's got enough people to know or to testify to the truth of the matter and then here we have sworn in sworn in I think that's the name by someone or other right and then at the bottom I don't know if I've gone down to that yet Woo. there it is true Bill. And if it's not a true bill, they used to write Latin phrase ig ignoramus, or um, we know not nothing, we know not of it, or nothing of it, or something like that. So that's basically how. So, so basically, what you're after is once you've explained it to the jury or the judge, they need to write true bill on it, on the back of the um, doodah. But that's quite simple. You can see how. The um, simple that is really the infant, um, apart from all the, the the grandiose language and the set format that they held there, you know, it's actually name, you know, who who they are, who who you are, the, the place, the county of their residence, and um, the crime, the taking and carrying away, and that's pretty much it. You can see how, apart from all the the, the predefined words, there's very little extra information that goes in on there. Um, let's have a look at our next one now. All right, so this is me just going through, and I'm looking at like indictments here. I'm taking pictures, and I'm just want to, I just want to see like. There's there's like four witnesses there. 
and here is like um, three witnesses, four witnesses. And I want to see, is there anything with just like one witnesses? What, one witness, I should say. And there was, there was there were there were a few examples of just one witness. This is another indictment. It's very, very large, very long-winded. Probably had a, an extremely well-paid lawyer to write this one. By the court, Lawson. By the court, Lawson. Oh, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know where the Lawson thing comes in. There we go. So these are very old documents. Very old and smelly. Covered in all kinds of old diseases, no doubt. Uh, a Lawson. So here's Lawson. I don't know if, what Lawson relates to a book, a code. Or... At the general court of session, uh, the peace of our sovereign lord, the king, Holden, St. Mary, Newington, uh, and the county of Surrey. Oh, right, maybe that was a venue then. Uh, Tuesday, the 15th day of January, 1805. That's just some interesting information. Read at your leisure. Uh, yeah, freeze the screen. Sorry, it's uh, oh, hang on, I can actually turn it around for you. Do, do, do. Here we go. Cool. And turn this around. Boop. There we go. Can we? Can we go? Next one. There we go. Okay. Turn that around for you. There we go. Just have a little read in your own time, if you wish, to enjoy my little excursion out and about. So then there's there's another one here. This one I think was this an assault. The jurors of our Lord, the King, upon their oaths, present present that James Morgan, late of the parish of somewhere, Mary, not with not with Stan, was that not with? I don't know. In the county, so it's just like the parish, the county of Surrey. Uh, is that Law? The county, uh, Lawrence, on the first day. I don't know what that says. I think this is a La of Bow or something. Of the first day of January in the 20th year on the reign of our sovereign Lord George. So this is before Victoria hit the throne. Um, this, that, this, now, I don't know, George III, maybe, oh, King, now, oh, hang on, now King of Great Britain, oh, God, with, oh, yes, arms, what, with force and arms, the parish aforesaid in the county aforesaid, in and upon Richard Jackson in the peace of God. Here we are, there we are. Some things are clear enough. And in what? And our said Lord the King. Yeah, and our said Lord the King. And there being did make an, I think that's assault, and him, the said Richard Jackson, did then and there, uh, gre gre grievous, grievous wound, bruise, and evilly bled, is that? Bled. So that his life was greatly depraved, impaired, depaired, I don't know that, of, and that said James Morgan, thou, thou, is that, uh, that, oh, is that, is that A for said again or something, I don't know, did other wrongs to the said Richard Jackson. To the great damage of is that that no hmm. said of that don't know that's a, that's an interesting one uh, he said I've said Richard it might just be all of said Richard Jackson and against the peace of our said Lord the King his crown and dignity Lawson signed again. See if I got the back of it. I probably did. Yeah. So Richard Jackson would be the primary witness. He'd be the 
be it, uh, the, the prosecutor. It'll be his case essentially, and he's got a, f a few. He's got four, four witnesses, uh, sworn by Brown. I think that is someone like that. True Bill. That's the foreman of the jury. So the, few, the, the foreman of the jury asks, and then they write. Then they, that's the clerk's writing. Obviously, True Bill. It's been found as a True Bill. And again. Just a few more examples of what's been going on. So I thought, hopefully you found that a little bit interesting, but um, I've cut the video here. Um, but it's interesting, because I believe there are legal crimes, like legislative crimes, and there are unwritten, abolished, if you will, if you look at my 1967 um, Theft Act of 1960, I think 67, 68, where they actually abolish, uh, if you read one of the terms, it actually says um, they hereby abolish, like, uh, particularly uh, extortion. So where do they go? If, if the written law is abolishing it, it's going off the written rule book, it's going back to the common law, the customs-led uh, law, which is unwritten. It's kind of a moral law. It's what people know is right and wrong. So this is where the law kind of I don't know why there's such confusion over this, but there, there is a lot of confusion over this. And um, although it, it's it's tricky to get your head around in some respects, but accessing the court is it's like the um, the legal society are accessing it because they have just as much right, if you will, as the people have to access this law. And although they might have the legislation and the and the government powers and all the other things to influence the common law, the common law at its core is always going to be the overall, the overriding, um, or the, or the. I think I've read once that it was um, where the where the written law goes out of, out of control, if you like. If it gets, starts overstepping its boundaries, then the common law, the moral law, the uh, unwritten law, in, in in some respects, is the thing that will keep it in balance. And it's been confirmed to you there, in in their own books, is that that's that's the nature of. of of the law that we have in this country, if you like. It's a common law land. It's not a civil code land where it'd be completely the other way around, where all this all your customs and stuff has to bend to the new written statute law, which in my opinion is very dangerous because it relies on people it, 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 well, I got rid of the dungarees picture, but you can it, it relies on um <laughs> it relies on uh you know Oh God, no, let's not go there. Stop, stop, nine. It relies on, um, you know, well, that's a fantastic example of dungarees, but <laughs> it relies on these fashions not coming and going, you know what I mean? It relies, it relies on everyone that from, from age to age. You know, what happens if this happens? <laughs> Hi, we're making your statute law and you have to abide it. Your cultures and your customs mean nothing. Yeah? And then suddenly this happens. Hi, we're making your customs and your cultures. And then suddenly, hi, we're now writing your customs and cultures. Oh, we are writing your customs and cultures. You know, every, now you have to obey this one. You know, you know, this is this is like Yeah, and then suddenly you get where's that guy? He was a good example. And then you get like a oh, where has he gone? This guy, and then suddenly, oh, hi there, I'm going to write your laws, and you're going to follow my laws now, you understand? The risks involved are quite large. Now, you would hope that all these people are good, honest, decent people, but um, that's where the common law comes in, in the, in the English system, the, the common commonwealth, the common law lands, is that whatever happens with the fashion, the law is the law. You know the law. Stick to it. We'll let you have your little parliaments, we'll let you have your little fun and games, but it all comes back to... You know, oh my God, yeah. So it all comes back to um, to the law.